What is going on, gunfighters? Welcome to Gunfighter Life, the podcast where we talk about guns, gunfighting, tactics, the right way, with almighty God at the center, Judeo-Christian values, and real-world, first-hand experience. Today, I hope, is going to be one of those quintessential episodes. If you don't listen to every episode, or if you only listen to one episode this year, perhaps this would be the one to listen to. Kind of the core things that you need to be an effective gunfighter. Kind of gunfighter philosophy. Recently did a thing on Patreon with a poll to see what the audience, mostly the patrons, wanted what they liked, what they wanted more of, and philosophy, I think, last I checked, got the most votes. So this is going to be a philosophy of gunfighting episode. I hope you enjoy it. With that, to establish in bona fides, I will put in the bio. If you want to skip it, you can skip around two-ish minutes. We'll get into the main topic. I'll roll into a quick abbreviated bio and then into the main topic. First and foremost, I'm a Christian. I don't apologize for that. God is number one in my life. I grew up hunting and fishing in the backwoods of the southeastern United States at a very early age. Some of my earliest memories are with firearms. I joined the Marine Corps at 17, did a couple of combat tours in Iraq. By God's grace, he got me through that safely. After that, I served as a instructor an urban warfare instructor, and a desert warfare instructor for the United States Marine Corps. I also served with the LAPD, both full-time as a sworn police officer and some more specialized assignments, as well as serving in the U.S. Army, full-time and part-time National Guard. I've been a FBI firearms instructor, still am an FBI firearms instructor, have been for a lot of years. Also NRA certified and some other three-letter government agency certified. I've been a private contractor for a three-letter government agency I won't specify. I've been the commander of a tactical team in a large metropolitan area. By God's grace, he got me through all that in one piece, not because I'm better, but because he chose to have grace and mercy on me. I've been a professional hunter and guide. Professionally hunted things like buffalo and elk. Not many people today can say they've done that, but I'm blessed to be able to say that I have. I've hunted everything from white-tailed deer on the east coast to mule deer on the west coast to gray squirrel on the east coast to prairie dog on the west coast and elk and bear and wolf and slain all manner of beast. A state rifle and pistol champion a few times over in a few different disciplines. Now those experiences... It's not because I'm bigger or badder. Certainly not bigger. In fact, I met one of the patrons in real life. and uh, He said something to the effect of, I thought you'd be bigger. Reminded me of that William Wallace movie. Where he's like, oh yeah, if William Wallace were here, he'd shoot lightning bolts out of his rear end. Well, I'm not William Wallace. But I am the person that did all those things in the bio. But not because I'm bigger or badder. I don't think that I survived when many other young good men did not i give all the glory and all the credit to god all the talents and experiences that he's given me and the things he's let me live through i hope to use them to glorify god and to help you today so i so if i boast in anything it's not in my strength it's in that god had mercy on me and saved me because he had a purpose for me and hopefully i can use those talent skills and abilities to serve you today Okay, so it should be no surprise, right, where I'm going to start. You start with God, where you always start. God is the number one thing you need for anything. To draw a breath, to have a heartbeat, to be a good man. You need God. You also need the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Thankfully, he gave us an instruction manual for life. If you want to be a good gunfighter, you need a strong moral compass. You need to not hesitate. And part of that not hesitating is having a clear delineation of when it's okay to use deadly force and when it is not okay to use deadly force. 
And I'm not talking about legally. You should check your box legally if you need to. But I'm talking about morally. Just because you could legally shoot, you could, there could be a circumstance where you could legally shoot somebody and get away with it, but it's morally wrong. I'm talking about morally, cut and dry, like the word of God says. In this scenario, this is okay. One example, if a thief is caught breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. You know, if he breaks that plane into your domicile, if you're in there and somebody breaks in, you know the word of God says you're good to go. Use of deadly force it all is authorized. You don't know unless so there's some accentuating circumstances like you know it's your your teenage daughter's boyfriend and you know what he's breaking in for. Like if you don't know the person or why they're coming into your house, then you it's reasonable to assume they have nefarious intent. It's just one example. But the overarching thing is you need to have a strong moral compass. Where does being a good gunfighter start? It starts with the Bible. It starts with God and the Word of God. You have to know, again, when you can and can't use deadly force. And if you don't know, then you'll hesitate. I don't care how much bravado and machismo and bunch of bull crap that you have. If you don't already know in your head when you will and will not pull a trigger, then you probably won't. Unless you're some kind of serial killer psychopath, which I doubt you are. This Taking a human life is a weighty, heavy matter, and it should never, ever be taken lightly. And just as human beings, again, unless you're that whatever percent that's a psychopath, sociopath, you're not going to do it flippantly. And if you don't have a clear, clear moral compass that says when you can and can't, if you don't have clear left and right lateral limits... If you don't have clear guidance and guidelines, then you probably will hesitate, and that may or may not get you killed. So you absolutely need a good, strong moral compass as to when it is okay and not okay to take a human life. All right, and the next thing I'm going to talk about that came long before a 1911, that came long before a Bill drill or a Mozambique drill or an El Presidente, Long before there was ever an El Prez drill, there's a common denominator for all great warriors throughout history, and that's courage. You have to have courage. You could have the best skill in the world. You could do a build drill at seven yards in under two seconds. But if you don't have the courage to pull the gun out of the holster and pull the trigger when you need to, if you're standing there shaking your boots, literally... If you're locked up with fear, then it doesn't do you any good. You have potential energy. You don't have kinetic energy because you're not willing to put it into action because you're afraid. And fear will get you killed. Courage. Courage. Throughout history, I don't care if it was a Zulu warrior or a crusader. Courage is a common denominator of all warriors that we admire throughout history. It is equally important in gunfighting. Courage. And not because you're so big and so bad. You should have confidence in the skills and abilities that God has given you. That's part of it. We'll get to that. But several verses come to mind. Remember I said start out with the word of God? There's a reason. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. A thousand may fall at my side, ten thousand at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Why do you fear no evil? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Because God is with us. We can do all things, not because of us, because of God. Not how strong we are, how God, how strong God is. Whatever strength we have, whatever talents we have, whatever abilities, they were given by God. Also, it takes away the sting, the fear of death. To live is Christ and to die is gain. I don't want to die, but I don't need to live. If God wants to take me today or tomorrow or... 80 years from now, that's fine. I'm God's. If God wants me to win that fight, I'm going to use the talents and skills and abilities he's given me to stop a threat. 
if, again, it's one of those clear uses of deadly force. But there should be no fear in death if you're the Christian. Of course, I don't like pain. I don't covet pain. But I'm not afraid of death. And I'm going to be honest, I was a gunfighter before I was a Christian. When I was young and in the Marines and brash and I thought war was going to be glorious and romantic, I honestly didn't really care much whether I lived or died, mostly because I was young and foolish and didn't care. And when I became a Christian, I realized that that wasn't the end-all be-all, right? My life did not end when my body got put in the dirt. So there's, there's no fear in it. Courage. Bold. Boldness. Courage. If you look at the Bible, one of the first things it mentions as categories of people in hell is the fearful. Don't live in fear. Now, I don't know if irony is the right word. Irony seems perhaps too lighthearted, but sometimes words fall short. But you're perhaps more likely to die if you're afraid of death in a gunfight than if you're unafraid. It's more likely to get you killed the fact that you are afraid. The fact that you are hesitating. right? Somebody that kicks down a door and hesitates because they're afraid is more likely to get killed than the person that's not afraid and rushes in. Bold. Speed, surprise, and violence of action is absolutely a force multiplier. It is absolutely the mark of a good gunfighter. Uh, if you didn't listen to the bio, if you skip through it, I've been a urban warfare instructor for the Marine Corps after my combat tours. I was a commander of a tactical team to stop active shooters. I've done specialized law enforcement stuff. I have done a lot of that type of work. It will absolutely increase your chances of catching a bullet in the face if you hesitate and are afraid when you kick down that door than if you rush in bold. Speed, surprise, and violence of action. So maybe irony is not the right word, but you're perhaps more likely to get shot if you're afraid of getting shot. So, you got to conquer that fear. The next one, what you need to be an effective gunfighter. Cardio. 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 You need cardio. Here's a little secret I'm going to tell you guys. Almost nobody likes cardio. I'll tell you a kind of a funny story. I'm not going to mention any names, but somebody... I don't think either her or her husband listened, but somebody that my wife knew and was friends with, um, my wife is, I'm blessed to have a very fit wife. She's got her master's degree in health, exercise, and sports science. She runs marathons. And one of uh, somebody she knew was like, well, it's easy for you. You like running. And we still joke about that because, no, my wife doesn't like running. I don't like running. Guess what I did this morning? Cardio for an hour. It doesn't matter that you like it. Nobody cares that you like it. Stop. Be a man. Being a man means doing hard things. You think cardio is crappy? Try getting shot because you're slow. Also, cardio helps with many things. Cardio helps with stress. If you get stressed walking upstairs, when you start getting bullets going back and forth in both directions, (laughs) that's stress on a whole other level. And your body... Your circulatory system, your heart, your lungs, they're going to deal with that stress a lot better if you deal with stress, physical stress on a daily basis. It is absolutely stressful. I'm going to tell you, it is absolutely stressful. If your heart never pumps hard, you're probably not going to perform well if your heart's beating out of its chest and you got to perform. Now, if you're used to your heart beating out of your chest and still performing, you do a lot better, right? I, and here's a little thing. Don't skip leg day. Don't skip cardio. I don't care, and if you've seen pictures of me, I'm very blessed by God to be in very good shape. Big biceps, six-pack abs, but here's the thing. In order for your arms to do anything, in order for your hands to fight, your feet have to get you there. Period. Right? This is not some fantasy. You're probably not going to be sitting there watching whatever people watch, Netflix, whatever people watch on Netflix. The Simpsons or South Park. I haven't had TV in a long time, guys. Whatever people watch on TV. Whatever normal people watch. Probably somebody's not going to break in. You're going to pause the show, stand up, shoot them, sit back down and watch Netflix. 
Never seen that happen. Maybe it's happened at some point. But even if that happens, you're probably going to have a pretty rapid heartbeat. But cardio is probably going to play into that equation, either just out of the rush of adrenaline and testosterone, or the fact that you actually have to locate, close with, and destroy the enemy. Cardio. In order for your hands to fight, your feet have to get you there. You may not like it. I didn't say you had to like it, but you got to do it. If you want to be good, if you want to be a gunfighter, not just a dude that owns a gun. That's one of the core differences. Cardio. It's absolutely an important skill. The next one, also important, I'm going to put on here, but after cardio, is strength training. Some kind of strength training. You might think, why? Guns aren't that heavy. They may not be that heavy at the time, but if you've ever stood on a perimeter for 12 hours, which could be a thing, if you ever had to stand guard or watch, which could be a thing in many scenarios, the guy that can stay alert for longer, stay at the low ready for longer, greatly increases his chances of staying alive. Try doing a 12-hour shift in body armor. Been there. Try doing a 12-hour shift with body armor and a gun belt. You think if we have some kind of major disaster or something like that, you might have to change your lifestyle and be on your feet a lot and doing strength stuff a lot. Also, I said in order for your hands to fight, your feet have to get you there, but sometimes your hands have to fight. I don't care even if you have a gun. A lot of times, gunfights end up on the ground. Before, during, or after you shoot somebody, you still may have to wrestle with them and fight with them. I've been in a lot, a lot of hand-to-hand combat. I'll be honest, because I wasn't always a Christian, probably a lot more than I should have. I've been in a lot of fights. I'll tell you that a lot of fights end up as a boxing match or a wrestling match. Strength is important. Here is another one, and I want to make sure I get this right. I said I would come back to it. Confidence. Now... All my glory goes to God. If I boast, I boast in God alone. Whatever talents I have, whatever self-discipline, whatever those things, they are a gift. I only have them because God gave them to me. I can only take a breath because God allows it. What did I have that I did not first receive? And the answer is nothing. I wouldn't exist if God hadn't created me. I wouldn't draw another breath if God didn't let me. I wouldn't be able to go another mile or do another push-up if God did not allow it by his leave, by his divine grace. But it is also written, to he who has more shall be given and he will have an abundance. We're supposed to use the talents and gifts we've been given. Be confident. Be confident in God that he will get you through it and be confident in the talents and abilities that God has given you. When I go up to a shooting competition, I go up to the line expecting to win. I go up to the line just thinking that 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 match is in the bag, right? And you don't, I don't know anybody that goes up thinking they're going to lose and wins. That's just not, that's a loser mentality. You need confidence. That is important when you step into the box in a shooting competition. That is way more important. You go to kick down that door and you're pretty sure there's somebody in there that's going to try literally with everything that he has to kill you. Confidence. Confidence. Confidence in your abilities that God has given you. Confidence that you've trained your men well enough that they can do their job. And confidence at the end of the day, because stuff happens, that God will get you through it. And if not, you're fine with that too. Like It goes back to what we already talked about with not being in fear of death. Being confident in your abilities. Like when You go win it, you go in it to win it. You don't go into a gunfight expecting to lose. Because there's generally no second place. You go into a gunfight to win. And if you go in with an attitude to win, that means confidence. Again, all the things and gifts you've been given from God. But you got to have confidence. I don't want somebody on my team kicking down a door going into a gunfight thinking they are crappy at gunfighting. Right? That's... No. I'm not talking about bravado. I'm not talking about arrogance. I'm talking about legit confidence. Like they know they can do it. You know you can do it. You know you're going to fight to the finish. Even if you get shot. Even if you get cut. Whatever it is. You're going to fight to the finish. Because you're a fighter. That's who God made you to be. It is written the Lord is a man of war. Exodus 15. The Lord is a man of war. We are made in his image. 
Again, I'm not talking about arrogance. I'm not talking about boasting. I'm talking about being confident in the abilities that God has blessed you with. And being confident that God can get you through the situation. Confidence. That transcends far more than just gunfighting, but it is important in gunfighting. It's important in life as well. I don't care whether you're asking a girl out that you want one day to be your wife because I don't believe in casual dating. I don't care if it's a fist fight. I don't care if it's a job interview. Confidence. But it's important in gunfighting as well. Here's one really important and I think sadly lacking in today's society. Common sense. I'm going to tie into that critical thinking. I think sadly today many of our education systems don't teach critical thinking or how to actually think for themselves. They teach you to memorize and regurgitate. Memorize and regurgitate. There is a time and a place for that. There is a time and a place for that kind of learning. There are some facts you just need to know and memorize. Like like a multiplication table. Right? It's probably good to memorize that. Some words you just have to memorize how to spell because they make no sense. Like the word beautiful or camouflage, right? They just, they make no sense. So you just got to memorize how they're spelled. Sometimes it makes sense to memorize stuff. But critical thinking, I think, is a much more important skill that is sadly not taught. I think because they don't want children to critically think because if they did, they'd probably question what they were being taught. But critical thinking in gunfighting is absolutely critical. You are playing, I don't know if I came up with this, but I've been saying that lately. You are playing 4D chess for keeps. You are playing like 4D chess unto death. Critical thinking is important. There is a time and a place for straight cardio and brute strength. There's a time and a place where you got to kick down that door and that doesn't require a lot of thinking. There is a time and a place to straight Wrap a dude up and choke him out. That requires brute strength and confidence. There is also probably many more times that will keep you alive for critical thinking. If you've ever done any kind of urban warfare and room clearing, geometry. Geometry is absolutely a gunfighter skill. Critically thinking. How can I do this and not get shot in the face? One of the things I would do on my war belt is keep a piece of 550 cord with a little clasp on it, and I'm pretty good at tying knots. Many doors, especially in industrial type environments, have kind of horizontal handles. Well, if somebody in there is trying to kill me and I open the door, where are they going to shoot at? The doorway. Where should I probably not be? The doorway. If I'm not sure, if if I'm sure they're in there, I'm probably just going to rush in, depending on whether or not I have a, a grenade or not, which is not common in civilian stuff. Even in urban warfare, flashbangs have kind of gone out of vogue because they start fires. But if I can test that first, I can, going back to that piece of 550 cord, I can make a bowling knot and or a lasso, quietly get on the handle of that door and be feet away. Somewhere where the person is not going to expect me to be and test whether they're going to shoot that door or not. Test whether they're going to shoot that doorway or not. Right? It's just one example. Thinking. Critically thinking. Critically taking a step back and evaluating a situation. Sometimes you got to rush in right away. It was a hard thing because I, when I was a commander of a tactical team, my guys were pros. They were professional gunfighters. They were good dudes. I was honored to work with them. But we were all kind of go, go, go. And I really had to press this into them, critically thinking, on a couple of different ways. And I'll give you two big examples. One, is there actively right now human life being taken in this area? Meaning like in this sports arena, in this room in this section of a building if the answer is yes and you you need to go in if the answer is no can you block them off and wait if they're not actively taking human life or if they're by themselves and they're armed and we get to a place where we have good cover can we wait wait for more people wait for more resources a lot of times once they calm down Once they get that massive adrenaline dump, a couple of things will happen. A lot of times, active shooters take their own life, which is not good. I don't want anybody's life to be taken, but better them take their life than them killing one of my guys or several of my guys. So that happens a lot. So if you can cordon them off, maybe it's better to wait. Or you can 
figure out a better plan and maneuver and get to them in such a way that they're not expecting. Or another one, and this was really hard to train because, again, my guys were good guys. There is an active shooter, an active life is being taken right now. We would often do uh, a lot of role-playing stuff with actors and whatever. It's hard to walk past a woman, and you call me sexist if you want, but this is just a common thing. It's hard for a man to walk past a woman screaming, saying she needs help, and not paying attention to her and going by her. Why would you want to do that? But if you're about to go take out an active shooter... You stop to help one person put on a tourniquet, do whatever, do a ch- sucking chest seal. That can take a while. If somebody's life is being taken literally every second, bang, another life, bang, another life, bang, another life. The best thing you can do is get in there and take care of that threat. That's the most loving thing you can do is stop that active shooter. That means, sadly, in the real world, you may have to bypass somebody that needs help and come back later. Okay, you stop and help them, and you got a tourniquet on them, and they may or may not have died, and maybe now they may live. In that amount of time, 20 other people have died? And I know that's horrible, and it was a horrible thing to train into my guys. But that's absolutely a real thing. So, critically thinking. you got to take the emotion out of it sometimes. And again, critical thinking is absolutely an important skill in gunfighting. A lot of people think of like gunfighters and stuff like that, I think, is just brutes, just all brawn and no brain. But the brain is what makes us great warriors and great gunfighters. Critical thinking is absolutely an important skill. Here is another one. Thinking outside the box. You might not think of creativity as a gunfighter skill, but it absolutely can be. There's Definitely a place to stick with the program. Definitely a time to stick with the program. Again, but there's also a time to be creative and critically think and think, can we do this a better way? Here's something that I would do with my guys before a mission or sometimes just before, sometimes just when we met. Literally take army men, like army men you play with as a kid. And I would get blueprints or a map of where we were actually working. And I would say, okay, you're the bad guy you're the active shooter or you're the enemy you're the adversary whatever the mission was if you wanted to do the most damage how would you do it and i would listen to their plan and i would say okay now i pick somebody else on the team how would you counter that and then i would ask somebody else and say does anybody else have any better ideas and most of the time it this would work out pretty well sometimes i would step in and say well have you ever thought about this or have you ever thought about that And I would kind of do that in the role-playing arena. And that creativity. A lot of times those guys may think of stuff that I hadn't even thought of. And I was the one in charge. Just because I'm the one in charge doesn't mean I'm the only one with ideas. Especially not when all our lives are on the line. If somebody else has a better idea, especially before the mission, I'm all ears. Now there is a time and a place where somebody makes a plan and you got to execute it. There's a time and a place where, again, speed, surprise, violence of action. But if there is time to critically think and be creative, if there's a better way to skin that cat, then, you know, look at it. Thinking critically. Again, people have different ideas, different backgrounds. Like, yeah, we could could have a couple of guys rush in on the ground floor. We could have one guy up here in Overwatch as a designated marksman who could take one good shot. We've got Overwatch. They're well hidden. Easily cover this entire arena. Think critically. I don't care if we can have three guys in there. If it's better to only have one because of crossfire, more is not always better. So, again, it's critical thinking. It's absolutely an important skill. And another absolutely critical skill is how do you balance those? Again, there's a time for brute strength. There's a time when you're doing, you know, grappling and ground fighting where you're literally trading blow for blow time for brute strength there's a time for cardio there's a time for speed surprise and violence of action there's a time to sticking to a plan because people are counting on you to stick to the plan to do your job so they can do their job there's also a time for critical thinking there's a time for being creative and knowing when to use those different skills that is important so knowing when to balance what skill and to use it when that's important another one endurance now endurance you might think of we talked about cardio already i'm not talking 
necessarily about that kind of endurance. I'm not just talking about, you know, not giving up on a ruck or in a run or whatever it is. I'm talking about withstanding hardships in a more broad sense. Again, if you've ever worked a 12-hour shift, a 12-hour grave shift in body armor, it's horrible. The guy that can stay alert, you know, an hour 11 of that shift, who's actually still paying attention, that kind of endurance. The endurance to keep going when, you, when you're in the desert and it's 100 and who knows how many degrees and you're in a full mop suit. You're digging a fighting hole every night going from Kuwait to Baghdad. And it's so miserable. And literally people are opting out, meaning committing suicide. Because it is so miserable. But you just keep going. That is endurance. That's the kind of endurance I'm talking about. It can be short term, it can be long term. The ability to just keep going. Have you ever done talking about a lot of fights end up on the ground hand to hand? Now, the more cardio you have, the more endurance you're going to have. But even somebody with great cardio is going to get tired, is going to get winded. Have you, if you've ever fought all out, whether boxing or grappling, for two minutes, it is crazy long. And you talk about endurance. That takes endurance. Again, more long term. Let's say you're in charge of clearing an entire building. And you've kicked down 12 doors. And you're like, there's nobody in here. Guess what? Behind door number 13, there's somebody. Staying alert, staying vigilant, staying mentally in the fight. Time after time. Endurance to withstand hardships. That is the mark. That is a mark of a good gunfighter. Endurance. Not just in gunfighting. That transcends gunfighting. It goes in with life as well. Sometimes you're just going to have bad days. Sometimes you have a lot of bad days one right after another. Sometimes you don't feel like going on. Endurance. Keep going. Some days, mo- I mean, by God's grace I work out every day but Sabbath. You know how many days I actually want to work out? Almost never. But I do it anyway. Whether I want to or not. Endurance. You know how often I want to wake up and just read my Bible doesn't matter how I feel endurance day after day week after week that kind of lifelong endurance and I guess before we talk about that in the endurance aspect we should have touched on discipline being well disciplined well regulated when you look at the second amendment it says the right of a well regulated well disciplined well trained we'll get into the training later but discipline doing it Having the self-discipline to actually train. Don't care if you want to or not. Feelings are for women and kids. You're a man. Do what you're supposed to do. Discipline. Discipline your spirit, your soul, your mind, and your body. You beat it into submission. Discipline. It's just one of the marks of a good man. Self-discipline. Also good in gum fighting. Discipline. Next thing I'm going to talk about is training and proficiency. You got to be good with your weapon. And I'm going to be honest, not always. You've heard my background, my bio. I I could be very, very, very well trained. And I could be in a giant crowd of people where I really can't pay attention to everybody. It's just impossible. And I could have some meth addict walk up behind me with a high point and shove it in my liver and kill me. And he may have never, that may be the first round he's ever fired in his whole life. No training. So I'm not going to act like you can't kill somebody without training. You absolutely can. But training absolutely can make you more proficient as a gunfighter. I don't think I should have to argue that point really. So going back to confidence. If you are confident in an ability you don't have, that's arrogance. And that's not good. That's probably the opposite of what you want. That's probably going to increase your chances of getting killed confident in something you don't have i could have false confidence and arrogance i could have i could if i truly believe that i could walk up to the roof right now and fly because i just really thought i could right i'm gonna probably die because i don't actually have that ability that's not real confidence training and proficiency though can give you actual confidence in your actual abilities like i know that i can hit that target 
Not only that, I know about how long it's going to take me under any given circumstance. Like I know I have pretty set standards for drawing and getting a round on a head plate at double arms distance on a normal day in about 0.8 something seconds. On a fast draw, 0.7, 0.6, or 0.7 something seconds. Like I know that. I know that most people, even most well, even what we would call well-trained average or better than average police officers, take about a second and a half. Average untrained person, even longer still. So, if me and somebody else are going for their gun, I have confidence that I can get that shot off way quicker than almost anybody. Confidence in the talents and skills God's given me to possess. That comes with training and proficiency. That comes with rep after rep after rep, dry fire after dry fire, day after day. It's going to come by some false bravado thing. Training and proficiency. That is absolutely key. I don't care whether, I don't care whether it's with a knife or with a sword or with a sling. You look at, read the story of David and Goliath, right? David is a man after God's own heart, and the Lord is a man of war. David was many things. He was a poet. He was a king. He was also a mighty warrior. You read that story, right? He walks along, and he finds appropriate ammunition. He finds appropriate stones. He knew what he was looking for. He had already slain lions and bears. Proficiency is important, right? Training and proficiency. And this all kinds of ties in together, right? The discipline, the self-discipline to keep training, even on days when you really don't feel like it, even on days when you're tired. Training. Dry fire. By God's grace, except for Sabbath, I dry fire every day. You know how many days I feel like dry firing? Right? Dry firing can be very tedious, very monotonous. Doesn't matter. Self-discipline. Self-discipline. It all ties in. And... Now, here's something else that you need as a gunfighter. You need a gun. You need a gun that is dependable, right? You need a gun that's accurate for the job you're trying to do. And to be accurate, to hit a target, actually has to fire and function correctly. Dependable, accurate, and here is crucial. And this part is crucial. Not accurate and dependable when fired by somebody on YouTube or somebody taking a bribe by that gun company or getting free stuff telling you that that gun is accurate and reliable. I mean accurate and reliable when fired by you with your ammo under your conditions under realistic circumstances, not on a bench. That kind of accuracy is fine, but that's not going to help you in a gunfight. I've never seen any gunfights take place off a bench. Accurate and capable and dependable when fired by you in real world situations in realistic environments with the ammunition you're actually going to run through it you know if you do a bunch of practice with a 115 grain full metal jacket ball in your carry gun and you load it up with 135 grain plus p and you've never trained it out of your gun that gun you have no idea whether it's accurate and dependable and reliable when fired by you I've had guns, I've had a Glock. It was absolutely good with some kinds of ammo and some other premium defensive ammo. It would, it was not reliable at all. You can't just assume, right? Again, when fired by you with that ammo under the actual circumstances. I'm, and we'll stick on the carry gun thing. This applies to rifles and stuff too, but not just when you're square at an indoor range at three yards. I'm talking about like realistic stuff. Like CQB stances. You're firing one-handed to left-handed. You're laying supine. You're laying prone. Does the gun function with that ammo? Again, realistic, real-world kind of stuff. The gun has to be dependable and reliable and accurate and shoot point of aim, point of impact when fired by you with your ammunition in realistic circumstances. That is important, but I think far less important than all the other stuff. And here's a main takeaway. A lot of times in America, we just want to be what I would call an Amazonian. We just want to fix it with a click and drop it in the cart and buy it. I'm good to go, man. I've got a Daniel Defense Mark 18. Cool. Having a Daniel Defense Mark 18 does not make you a gunfighter. It makes you a dude that has a gun. It makes you a dude that has a nice gun. I'll grant you that. But it has no bearing on whether you can use it or not. 
if some dude on meth breaks into your house wanting to kill all the men and do whatever he wants to do to the women, use their body without consent, and your Daniel Defense Mark 18 is locked in a safe and he's got his high point ready, well, I hope you're good at cardio and strength. It's probably going to be a, gun, a hand, hand-to-hand combat at that point. He's going to have the advantage. He's got a gun. Having that Daniel Defense Mark 18 does not make you a gunfighter. So you got it in your hand when he breaks in. If you don't have the courage to actually pull the trigger, just some false brother like, oh yeah, I'll do it. Again, taking a human life is a is a big deal. Unless you're a psychopath, which you're probably not, it is a big deal. You got to have a clear line of when you will and will not shoot. You have to, you know, have that kind of mental discipline and training, and have clear right and wrong moral standards. If you got a Daniel Defense Mark 18, you're not willing to use it, or you don't train with it, so there's, you know, rounds in the magazine, but not one in the chamber. You forget that and pull the trigger, and it goes click, and you don't know how to clear that. You don't know how to put a round in the chamber quickly, and he gets to you first. Again, that goes back to training and proficiency. You should have been racking that charging handle when you were bringing it up to fire if you want to carry it in condition three. Or you do it some weak sauce kind of manipulation and you induce some malfunction. You weren't proficient with your weapon. I don't care that you have a Daniel Defense Mark 18. If you short stroke that charging handle and don't get that round into the chamber, it can be the best, most accurate rifle on the planet, but you can't run it and you didn't manipulate it properly and you're not proficient with your weapon. It's not going to work. That's how that works. Again, confidency, proficiency, courage. Doesn't matter that you have a Daniel Defense Mark 18. That does not make you a Navy SEAL. That does not make you a gunfighter. Just like flipping that back on me, you could give me... I don't know what a nice piano is. Oh, let's stick with guitars. Uh, I don't really know much about guitars either, but like it's a Fender Stratocaster. I don't know who, but I'm sure some rock star somewhere plays a Fender Stratocaster give me his Fender Stratocaster right out of his hands I can't play that doesn't matter about the gun the, it is if I want to one day be a rock star or one day play simple man on the Fender Stratocaster yeah I need to have a I need to have a guitar but my training and proficiency is way more important than being able to play that song whether I got a acoustic guitar at a pawn shop or a brand new Fender Stratocaster tuned by whomever that's great at tuning guitars right that doesn't matter because i can't freaking play the guitar if you don't have all the other things the fact that you have a gun again that doesn't make you a gunfighter and i think a lot of people today think that oh i've got a gun check the box i'm good to go somebody breaks into my house i've got a home defense gun i've got two home defense guns so what not impressed bro let me see you run it under stress let's get some blue gun training in where you're fighting over the gun on the ground like stuff like that like that that's the mark of a gunfighter let me see you kick down a door when you're not sure if somebody in there is trying to kill you or not and go in there fearlessly confidently confident confident that God can get you through it and confident in the talent and skills and ability that God's given you that you're strong that you're proficient have a good moral compass and you know you won't hesitate because you know when you can and cannot pull the trigger that that's a gunfighter you know how far down on the list it is that is to me that you have an ambidextrous aftermarket charging handle man just I, I think a lot of times we get our our priorities backwards and obviously i talk about gear a lot uh, a lot of people like to hear stuff about gear but there's a reason I put it in the order that I did today. Think about that. Think about what's really important, not what you want to be important. Are you in this just to buy cool stuff? If so, just be honest with yourself. And But don't call yourself a gunfighter. Don't even call yourself a warrior. Just say, I'm a dude that likes tactical stuff, and I want to have guns. That's fine. It's your right as an American. Have all the guns you want. Have a safe full of guns. But don't pretend to be a gunfighter. Don't pretend to be a warrior, because that's not what makes a warrior. Having a hammer doesn't make you a carpenter. Having a violin doesn't mean you can play a symphony. Having a plane doesn't mean you can fly. Having a gun doesn't make you a gunfighter. Anyway, with that, I hope you enjoyed. You guys asked for more philosophy. And I realize after recording this, there are a certain subset of people that are listening to this nodding their heads. And there are some people listening to this that it seems like they got slapped in the face with a frozen mackerel. And you come to a harsh realization. 
Well, you can either do something about it, be a man, start reading your Bible, be confident, start training, take it seriously, or you can just give up. That's up to you. It depends on what kind of man you are. And I realize this is that kind of episode, but I think sometimes people need that. Sometimes men need that. Again, this, this like 4D chess. Plan for keeps. Where many times there is no second place if you have to do it for real. All right, if you want a less severe hobby, go take up bowling or baking cakes or whatever people do. Right? Just care about you too much to say, okay, you've got a gun. You're ready. You're basically good to go. I care about you too much for that. So hopefully you appreciate that. If you appreciate this episode, if you appreciate the content, please consider becoming a patron. Patrons get all kinds of cool insider content. They get a lot more access to me. If they want to, they get to be part of an insider Patreon chat. Today we're chatting about what are preferred methods for sights on a shotgun. But it could be any number of things. We talk about, you know, go for Bible verses, important stuff like we talked about. Sometimes we'll help each other troubleshoot, hey, my gun is doing this. What does that mean? Like, can somebody help me diagnose this? It's, and it's not just me, right? There's guys in there that have a lot more experience. That chat actually helped me the other day. I had never had this happen before, but I got a flat tire. I've had that happen. But I've never had a tire that wouldn't come off after the lug nuts were off. The wheel would not come off. I sprayed it with WD-40. It wouldn't come off. I beat it with a rubber mallet. It wouldn't come off. One of the guys in the chat gave me a really good tip as to how to get that wheel off. It's not just me helping in there. It's us helping each other. It's a group of like-minded men helping each other. Just one part of what's on Patreon. If you want to become a patron, there should be a Patreon link in the show notes. I'd be humbled and blessed to have you over there. With that, your tactical tip of the day. Talking about the ground fighting for the tactical tip, going back to the ground fighting, a lot of fights end up on the ground, whether or not you have a gun. And you should be proficient and know how fast you can get a gun out. You should know uh, close quarters combat, you know, retention tactic for your firearm. Not just standing at a square range and shooting a target at 3 yards, 7 yards. What if a dude's right up in your grill? Do you know how to retain that gun? The stupid stuff you see on the internet that I'm so sick of where the guy like holds the gun out with one hand and the guy takes the gun away. No actual trained gunfighter is going to hold the gun out like that. That's not how that works in real life. That's Hollywood stuff. Like having a close-in retention technique. Also part of retention, ground fighting, knives. Be a couple of tips here. For years, I carried a folding knife. Even, even when I was in the military, even when I would have like carry a K bar or a bayonet, a lot of times for my EDC knife, even when I had a big full size knife, I would carry a folding knife in my pocket. When I started doing a little bit more ground fighting and stuff, especially as a commander of a tactical team trying to retain that weapon, I realized that even if I had a folding knife in my support pocket in my pocket, I may not be able to get it out and get it open and use it in time. Right. If I'm trying to keep my gun in the holster to deny use of that gun to somebody else, I have another free hand and I can get a hold of my knife, but can I open it? I prefer, you don't have to do this, you do whatever's best for you, but you should train and know. Don't think because you do this and now you're good at it, you have to train with it. Like training being on your back, being in the guard position, accessing a fixed blade knife in your support pocket, meaning whatever side my gun is on, if I carry my gun, since I'm right-handed on my right side 3 o'clock, I carry my knife on my other side. That way I have a weapon accessible on both sides. If somebody's got me pinned down and I'm on top of my gun and my arm is pinned behind my back with my other side, I have a weapon on my left side. And a fixed blade, I can get out. And if I can get it out, I can pretty assuredly get it into action. Much more easily than even like an automatic knife, which I may or may not be able to get into action. The fixed blade knife is a great tool to make space to get somebody off me to, if they've got their hand on my gun, to get them off of my gun. So I can get my gun out safely and make space. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do this. But one of my preferred ways, and it's really, I'm not going to say it's completely concealed, but it's very minimalist. I mean, it's, I don't think, any more obvious than just a clip in your pocket. What I like to do, it's called an ulti clip. Many fixed blades today will come with a Kydex sheath. It's an ulti clip. It's basically a clip, a metal clip that clips down pretty securely, and you can clip it with the knife inside your pocket and I like to run the knife with the blade towards the front of my body and run that knife 
handle against the seam of my pants. And that generally blends in pretty well. It generally, unless you're nice like bright pink or bright orange or something, if it's a neutral colored knife like Canvas Micarta or OD Green, it's probably going to blend in pretty well. And it's a fixed blade, which has a lot of advantages for all kinds of things, from tactical to practical, for simplicity, for strength. It's accessible, and it blends in pretty well. If you're like me, and you carry your gun on your other side, and you carry an outer garment over it, it covers it up as well. And again, I like that on my opposite side from my gun. So that ulti clip with a fixed blade in your pocket, that that is a good system, whatever knife you want. Again, the knife... I'm not saying it's not important, you need to train with it, but I don't care if you got a 3 inch blade or a 5 inch blade or a giant Rambo knife. But you're better off with a 3 inch blade that you train with and actually carry than a Rambo knife that again you're not proficient with and you don't train with. That extra 3 inches of blade is not what makes it lethal, you wielding it effectively is what makes it an effective weapon. Anyway, tactical tip of the day there, tactical verse of the day. This is from the book of Revelation, some people spend more time in Revelation than others, but Let's go with this. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. But watch out for yourselves. But watch out. Watch and be ready, men. Watch and be ready. Whether it's the Great Tribulation, which we all know is happening because the Bible is the only book that consistently predicts the future. About all that pagan other garbage, astrology, and just just, just garbage. You want to know actual history of the world and the actual future of the world? Again, what do we start with? God and the Word of God. Read your Bible. It tells you. Whether it's the Great Tribulation or smaller tribulations, because looking back through history, there's been a lot of tribulations. Read the book in Joseph and the Seven Years of Famine, or how about Noah and the Flood, right? There's many tribulations that come and go throughout history, and there's a big one coming. Watch and be ready. Wars, famine. Today's episode, hopefully, is part of that actually getting you prepared, not just buying something on Amazon or buying something at the gun store and thinking you're good, but actually watching and being ready. Actually being a effective man who can use violence when he needs to and not, and have the discipline to not use it when he doesn't. Being a good, effective warrior. Gunfighter. Being a good, strong man of God. With that, thanks for listening and have a blessed day.